What's your name? Jacqueline. Ja who? Jacqueline. Jacqueline is the name we give to these parts here. Would you agree with that? Yes. Would you agree? So the Buddha says we first establish Jacqueline, and then what we have to do is investigate those parts, because where else would you investigate for this independent Jacqueline in there that the ignorance in Jacqueline's mind believes is there? So do you agree with, do you agree with that? Yes, I believe I have a lot of ignorant views. Okay, so, no, sure. So the point is, this is so the point is there is from the point of view of the discussion of what is looking for the inherent Gen uh, Jacqueline, we have to start, so we have to look somewhere. If I say there's $5 in, I have to, you know, please go and find my $5. I've got to give you the place where I think my $5 is, don't I? Would you agree with that? So if I think, I have to think, I can't just say go and find my $5. I mean, you'd have the whole universe to look, you'll never end, you know, so we, I can narrow it down to it's going to be in the lounge room. So you have the basis, so, the, so then you have to search for that $5 in the lounge room. We're talking ordinary convention here, right? So what are your options? What will you find? What are the two options that you would find, having searched? Let's say you complete your search. What are the two options of what you could find? We're talking about finding $5, keep it simple. So you search in the lounge room. The parameters of the search is the lounge room. So you're going to search for $5. So when you've completed your search and you'll come to me, what are the two options of, you, what, of what you might have found? Either you've found the $5 bill or you haven't. And so what's the name of the second thing that you found? A missing $5 bill. No, the absence of $5. That's the meaning of the word emptiness. So you will find on... You will find the emptiness of $5 where? In the search. No, in the lounge. If I think $5 is in the lounge, the lounge is where you search, isn't it? So you'll either find $5 and give it to me, or you will discover there's no $5, which means you've just cognized the absence of $5. That's the way to put it. Can you hear that? So where, does, where would the $5 have existed if it did exist? In the lounge. Can you, not, don't make, can you hear me? Yes. But you didn't say it easily. You didn't answer. If I said, this, I think there's $5 in the lounge, you have to search in the lounge, don't you? Which means behind the sofa, under the cushions, under the, ward, under the cupboard, under the chairs. Would you agree? Whatever's in the lounge, you have to search my $5. You agree? Okay. So then the basis of your search is the lounge. Would you agree? Would you agree? Yes. Okay, so then you're going to find $5 and give it to me and we're all happy, or you will find the absence of $5. Would you agree with that? Yes. So the absence of $5 does exist. Do you agree with that? Yes. The absence of $5 is a real phenomenon that does exist, doesn't it? Isn't it? And where does that absence of $5 exist? From your past actions. God almighty. Where does the absence of $5 exist? Where did you just find the where did you just find the the absence of five dollars? In the lounge. Thank you. So the absence of five dollars exists in the lounge. Do you accept that? Thank you. And so now Buddha says there's a particular delusion in our minds that believes that among these parts, instead of the lounge, we have a body and a mind. That we believe in there somewhere there is an inherent I. He says we think that. Okay? So he's asking us to search for it. Okay, so where do you think the eye exists, Jacqueline? Where do you think this eye exists, Jacqueline? In an attachment from our... Darling, where do you think this eye exists? What's the basis of the... Of, of, where do you think... The, I just said it before. Where's the, where does this, you think this eye exists? In our own minds. No, dear. What is the basis of the label, Jacqueline? Have, has, is Jacqueline concept. made up of a body and a mind? Is, does, is body and mind the basis of the label Jacqueline? This body and mind here on that cushion, is that the basis of the, is that the way we have to look for Jacqueline? Yes. Would you look for Jacqueline in Fred's body? Would you look, look for Jacqueline in the toilet? Would you look for Jacqueline in the couch? No, you'd look in the body and mind of the person we know conventionally is called Jacqueline. Would you agree with that? Yes. Do you agree with that? Okay, good. So you have to search for the inherent Jacqueline. 
So obviously, first of all, you have, like the five dollars, you have to know what the inherent Jacqueline looks like, don't you? You have to imagine what it would be if it did exist. Would you agree? Yes. Otherwise, you couldn't search for it, could you? Could you? And where would you search for it? Where would you search for the inherent Jacqueline? Where do you think the inherent Jacqueline exists? Okay, I'll start again. Is Jacqueline the name we give to that body and so is the name we give to this body and mind sitting there? Would you accept that? Yes. We don't point to the pillar or the toilet when we say Jacqueline, do we? Yeah. So when I point there, what am I pointing to? The pillar? I'm pointing to you. Oh, okay. So what am I pointing to? The body and the mind, yeah? Am I pointing to the body and mind of the person labeled Jacqueline? Yes. I'm pointing to the body and mind, aren't I? Would you agree that Jacqueline is the name we give to this body and mind? Yes. So if Jacqueline makes the mistake of thinking there's an inherent Jacqueline in there, an inherent Jacqueline, which Buddha says we do think, where do you have to search for it? In the body and mind. Thank you, Jacqueline. Good. So that's the basis of your search. Like the lounge is the basis of your search for $5. So you're going to search for that inherent Jacqueline in the basis which is the body and mind. You've got to be precise. You've got to establish your parameters of your search. So you keep searching and keep searching. And Buddha would say when eventually you have a realization, what you're going to discover, what you will, what you will find is the emptiness of that inherent Jacqueline. Can you hear those words? Yes. That's when you're successful. So that you will have done your search among the parts called the body and mind. And you will have exhausted your search among the parts in the body and mind, and you will come up with the recognition of the absence of an inherent Jacqueline in the body and mind. Not in the toilet, not in the pillar, in the body and mind. So okay, like you, now we're ready for what you just said. That sounds like you said that we're saying there's an inherent body and mind. But yes, that could be the mistake. But then you start to say, well, where's the body? Let's start looking for the body that seems to be inherent. And it's exactly the same discussion. What is body? What is the body? It's a heap of bones and flesh. No, it's the label we give to the parts of the body. Do you accept that? Yes. So that's called ear and nose and pee-pee and caca and atoms and bones. Would you agree? So in exactly the same way that you searched for the phenomenon called inherent Jacqueline among the basis of the label Jacqueline, which is the body and mind, now we're going to do the identical search among the basis of the label body. So let's just choose one piece and we're going to choose the ear. Oh, maybe I've got an inherent, maybe there's an ear that exists. No, because when you're going to start searching for the inherent ear on the basis of the label ear, which is the parts of the ear, the drum, the, fl the flap or whatever, and you're going to search and search and you will then realize the emptiness of inherent ear on its base. And then you think, well, maybe I've got a nose and you'll do just the same thing. Then you search for the inherent nose on its base, which is the parts of the nose, up the nostril, down the nostril, around here, in the something, and you will then realize the emptiness of the inherent nose on the basis called the nose. And you keep doing this until you get to the subtlest atoms in the universe, and it'll be the same discussion every time. You will never find an inherent anything. But you have to start with the base, and you then do the search, and then you realize the emptiness of the eye, but then you have to realize the emptiness of the base as well. And everything is like that. So is it safe to say the base is a label for the parts? What? Is it safe to say that the base is a label for the parts? No, base is the parts, same thing. Base and parts means the same. Thank you. Then you get, take whatever name we give to those parts, called body, called mind, called pillar, and then you look for the inherent pillar among its parts, which is the basis of the label pillar, which is the bits and pieces here, the bricks and the cement. You've got to be precise. There's always the basis. Yes, from the point of view of the discussion of an inherent pillar, you have to find the convention called a base. But then we have a tendency, which is what you just said, which is good. Oh, well, it sounds like there's an inherent base. No, because you won't find an inherent base either. And everywhere you search, every phenomenon in the universe, it's the same discussion. So you end up with the emptiness of whatever exists, but there's nevertheless you find that emptiness on the base. Emptiness of inherent Jacqueline exists on the base. So, okay, the, the subtlest meaning of emptiness, it seems, I mean, I've been reading Lama Zopa's teachings recently, and he said that when we've got the, the understanding of the emptiness of the subtlest mistake, which is the, the inherent I, which is an I that finally is 
um, not existing, is not, not depending on the mind, then the base seems, like from what Rinpoche says, the base seems to be the mere I. So that's even more subtle, and I don't quite get that one. He says the emptiness of the I exists on the mere I. The emptiness, are you listening? The emptiness of the, of the emptiness of the inherent I. The inher inherent I is the specific term used in Prasangika Majamika for the, for the I that's not, that is, that's not dependent on anything, including especially the mind that calls it that, the merely labelled. So it seems like the merely labelled, seems like the emptiness of the non merely labelled I exists on the merely labelled I. That's how Rimache seems to be saying it. Okay. Any other questions, people? Yes. Yep. Thank you so much. Um, I'd been reading this book by Tralag Rinpoche, yes. which just came out, Karma, What It Is, What It Isn't, okay, Why wonderful. It Matters. Yes. And one line in it struck me as uh, confusing. Yes. He said, uh, yet not everything we experience is due to karma, which is another novel aspect of the Buddha's thinking and a somewhat neglected one. He did not state that the entirety of our experience... He did not state what? Uh, he did not say that he did not state that the entirety of our experience is due to what we have done before, uh -huh. whether pleasant or unpleasant, uh -huh. we can experience things which we are not responsible for. He doesn't say more? After that, does not explain it? Uh, in the end, it's the way that we deal with things that counts, which is I a reflection of character. I have no idea. I can't, I, can't, I can't even, I can just say I can't agree with that, but I have no idea where, I mean, Rinpoche, fantastic, you know, I can't say anything to that. That's not my understanding at all. Because l later on, he completely concurs with what you'd said about that. And there's no misfortune that we experience that yeah. doesn't have some cause, yeah. which I seems understand. like a contradiction. No, I understand. I understand. I mean, I can't say what Rinpoche is meaning there. I can't comment, you know, because also it's the editor. Yes. Maybe editors do bad jobs, you know. Okay. I can't say. Because it's very, no, it is, it's okay. It's kind of interesting. Because you hear sometimes His Holiness when he's talking to Western scientists and things say something similar. And so I remember having this discussion with one of the Geshis. He asked me, what do I think of that, you know? And if I follow through using these teachings, using the logic that I understand, there can't be anything that, isn't, that we experience that isn't the fruit of karma. It, and that, that implies emptiness. So it's, I can't say. I don't know what to say. I can't say anything. I can't comment. Okay, but that, yeah. that it is, a, I'm not crazy in thinking that seems to be a contradiction. No, that's right, exactly, yes. it seems to be a contradiction. Okay. That's right. So, yeah, I can't say anything. And it was published posthumously, so who knows, maybe oh. an <laughs> editor went haywire. He then just has got, who knows? No, I, I know, who knows? I can't say, I'm so sorry. Uh, my other question yes. about karma. Yeah. Um, Sam had touched on it a little bit yesterday in his question about the mind stream, and I know that's sort of a concept that can be taken too literally, but I'm wondering, it's, it still seems to me that the mind, my per, like, I guess my question is, what is personal karma, and how is that different from an Atman or some kind of discrete Oh, yes, of course. Me? Oh, absolutely. It's simply the way that it exists. First of all, you can't even, I mean, you mean in the mind being equivalent to Atma? Yes. He just, okay, just because something is beginningless and endless doesn't mean it's inherent. I mean, even just from the point of view of impermanence, the Buddha would, as we know, the Buddha would suggest there's no first moment of mind and there's no, and the Mahayana view would say there's no ending to mind, so then we can say mind is beginningless and endless. <laughs> but it's also impermanent. It's changing from moment to moment. So there's gross impermanence and there's subtle impermanence. And gross impermanence is something's coming into being and then breaking. So from that point of view, consciousness is beginningless and endless. It never comes into being and then disappears. But it's got the quality of subtle impermanence, which means it's changing from moment to moment. And they say that understanding subtle impermanence can help us understand emptiness. So therefore, the deeper understanding of something that's beginningless and endless, which is changing from moment to moment, is also that it doesn't have an inherent nature. And the difference between Atma and the Buddha's view even of subtle consciousness, it is something... You, you can say that very subtle consciousness is the equivalent of what they call Atma or soul. You could say that, because it's something that does continue after life, which is what they talk about the soul. But the difference is in the way it exists. 
not so much that there is something subtle that exists. An atma must be something subtle. A soul is something subtle. A soul is a very subtle consciousness. The difference is not so, it, it, the difference is in the way it exists. And so the Buddha's argument with the view of the atma or the soul is that it's permanent, not caused, unchanging and inherent. And he just goes tick, 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 that's not a possibility. So he would say there is a very subtle consciousness that is impermanent and doesn't exist from its own side. It's a dependent arising. So it's the way that they exist, not so much that it's not a similar equivalent sort of thing. Even you could argue, you know, the Buddha, I remember last year I was at a conference at a Catholic university in Melbourne and I chose as my topic, just for 20 minutes, 10 minutes, to talk about the similarity between the definition of God and the definition of Buddha. I looked up the Merriam-Webster dictionary and God is defined as three characteristics, infinite compassion, infinite wisdom, infinite power. Well, that is exactly the definition of a Buddha. So a Buddha is a being whose consciousness pervades the universe, who knows everything and has infinite empathy for every being, right? Now that sounds like God, but the Christ it's the interpretation of how that exists is the difference. The Christian teaching is that energy like the Atma or the soul is inherent. It doesn't exist in dependence on anything. It isn't impermanent. It is frozen in space. It is absolute. It doesn't change and it's, it is not caused. So all Buddha is saying is that type of phenomenon can't exist. He doesn't argue with the view of consciousness pervading the universe. He doesn't even argue with the view that a, a superior being called a Buddha can, can create a universe. Of course they can. they can, they're creating millions of forms of their own mind throughout universes. But the point, the difference would be that the Christians say that God creates me and then I got naughty and became ordinary. Well, but whereas the Buddhist you would be, if you, when you're a Buddha, you can happily manifest another person over there, but it would never be separate from you. It would look like a dog, it would act like a dog, but it's a manifestation of your mind. So it's not a dog, it's pretending to be a dog. And it would be you always, it could never be separate. So this idea that we can be created by a superior being and then become ordinary and separate, that's an impossibility for Buddha. You see what I'm saying? Yes. So uh, when this manifestation of me dissolves and my consciousness goes uh -huh. on to some yes, other thing, fine. that consciousness is would different than the consciousness of another person. No, it's, it's just, a, it's like a continuity. Right. This is why they talk about mental continuum. So at the time of your death, what's your name? Kevin. Kevin. The time of Kevin's death, the, very, the gross consciousness, which is your sensory, will gradually cease to function along with your gross body. So you'll stop breathing, the senses will stop. By the time you stop breathing, you're halfway, you know, you're, you're, you're the first stages of the death process. And by this point, um, Already before you stop breathing, the karmic seed that would that would trigger your that would be the seed that will program you to go to your next mother, dog or human or whatever, depending on the karma that ripened. And we're all carrying around trillions of karmic seeds. It's the only way to say it. Meaning, what Buddha is saying is this consciousness. It seems so abstract to us because this consciousness, which is not physical, it, 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 the only way to use is the analogy of seeds and fruits. Every millisecond of whatever that mind has done since the beginning of this time, it, it's bearing the imprints of those, it's storing those karmic seeds. It's the only way to say it. We can't visualize it because it's not physical. It just sounds so abstract to us. But there's not a millisecond of anything you see, hear, taste, touch, smell, think, do, that doesn't get imprinted in your mind doesn't get programmed in your mind, doesn't get stuck into your mind. So there's millions, of all, they're all existing as millions of, of, of potentials. So the time of death, depending on how you die, one of those will be triggered that will be the main cause that will send you to the next mummy. At the same time, all the other trillions of seeds that will produce your experiences, produce your tendencies, produce your environmental results will also be triggered. And you're all programmed even before you stop breathing. And then your consciousness gets, gro the grosser level ceases. You go to the subtle level after you've stopped breathing because the mind can stay for up to three days, they say. And you go through this subtle process, ever more subtle, ever more subtle, throwing off the subtle consciousness, throwing off the different levels of subtle energy, the subtle wind, etc. Then you get to what they call very subtle consciousness, which is the subtlest level of your conscious being, which is inextricably linked with this very subtle wind energy. That's the, the, and these are the building blocks of the new person. The karma's already programmed, you're already programmed, and then when you leave the body, the second it leaves, they say it all gathers to the heart chakra. It leaves the heart chakra already. Kevin is completely over. The package called Kevin is finished. 
all that's left is the imprints of everything Kevin ever said, said, done and thought, plus all the other imprints from countless lives. And that is now that energy, that consciousness is driven by this karma. And then when your new mummy and daddy are in bed, you're in this intermediate state, like a dream state, which is like your subtle mind again. And you're kind of desperately a bit waiting for another rebirth. And then new mummy and daddy come along and karma ripens. You run like a magnet and you leap in and off the next person goes. Then in living out, the fruits of those seeds that were triggered at the time of your death and carrying with you all the other trillions of seeds that haven't been manifest that haven't manifested yet and so it keeps going thank you so the content they talk about continuity so strictly speaking you think about it logically there's no there's not a real vivid thing called a continuity because all we can point to is this moment of kevin's mind the next moment doesn't exist, and the past one's gone. So at any given moment, there's always, a con there's always a, just a moment of mind. But the point about calling it continuity means the crucial point for us to get used to the Buddhist idea as opposed to the materialist is that the, 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 whatever's in the Kevin's mind is not merely the response to what your mummy did and daddy did and this did and that did and your brain and your this, which is how we think, but is simply the, 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 the consequence of, of, a, of something similar in that consciousness a second before. In the same way that we know very well, if you practice piano every day, you know perfectly well you get up today, the total of your past practice informs your ability to play piano today, doesn't it? So we'd call it stored in the brain. Buddha would say all that memory and habit is stored in your consciousness. So you can't point to the moment of consciousness before you went to bed, that's finished. But you carry with you the habits that you must have stored in your consciousness, otherwise you wouldn't be able to play piano today. The same with our non-virtues and virtues and life or whatever, tomorrow or the next life. You with me? Okay. Yes. Yes. I was uh, struck by your comment that every attachment is the result of virtue. No. Uh, is the no, no, no. I mean, every attachment, I mean, I'm sorry. Every fruit uh, uh, of happiness, uh, every happiness. Every moment of happiness. A moment of happiness that comes moment of from pleasure. attachment is... No, not every... No, I hear you saying. Strictly speaking, the right words for it, you, you're getting it almost right. Strictly speaking, the right words are every moment of pleasure that we experience in our mind, right, is the fruit of a virtuous seed we must have planted from doing a virtuous action in the past, but the trigger for it, given the kind of body and mind construct that we have, is attachment and contact with an object. Is there anything um, that we can use in that to cut the attachment? In other words, uh, an awareness of the virtue that brought us the pleasure. You can't remember the virtue, no way. Just learn it. You learn the theory. You yeah. learn the theory that every moment of your happiness is the fruit of a virtue. So then taking the Mahayana view, you would rejoice in that good feeling. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. You'd, but you wouldn't, I mean, you, but, you, but you'd have to avoid doing negative things first. Starting point is stop killing, stop lying, stop stealing, stop doing the usual things that attachment and aversion drives us to do because we're convinced that they're the cause of happy feelings. So we now are buying into Buddha's view that says actually they're not. So we have to consciously with discipline stop killing, stop lying, stop stealing, stop cheating, stop eating too much cake, stop jumping on the wrong person. Do you understand? Because we know that'll sow a negative seed in our mind, even though it triggers good feelings. We know that now, so we will refrain the best we can to do, from doing negative actions. So then we can start learning to know our mind more deeply and see what the attachment is. And then when we do have pleasant feelings, whether it's just because you get a nice piece of cake and someone's kind to you or the weather's pleasant, you don't just greedily eat it up as attachment would allow, get us to do. You're conscious that it's the fruit of your virtue, so you rejoice in it and you think that is the fruit of my virtue, I must not waste it and I'm gonna keep creating more of it. Okay, thank That's you. That's the one. I mean, I was Huh? I, I, w I was thinking about rejoicing. That's right. Rejoicing. But the crucial but I, thing it, is it, it, we have to refrain from doing the negative actions yeah. that we would normally think would be the cause of good feelings. Right. Which is quite painful hard work. 
And then the opposite of this too is every time a bad feeling rises, we also rejoice because now we just finished, we just got rid of that karma, you know, we just finished that karmic seed. Because every second a seed ripens, it's the end of that seed, isn't it? So that's, that's the, the, the really good attitude that can help us change. Okay. You know, you. Using, this ba using this as our interpretation. That's what I was okay, looking good. for. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Someone else? Any more questions? So, okay. Yeah. I did tell it. Oh, I don't remember. Darling, I can't remember. I'm so sorry. Go on. What, I'll, I'll try and remember, though. Go on. Okay, hello. Um, when you were speaking with Jacqueline, you had mentioned um, this concept of what is Jacqueline's body and mind. And then when speaking with Kevin, you talk about this, like, sort of boiling down to, like, this very subtle consciousness that at the end of life, like, this into the heart, etc. How are the body, the mind, and this subtle consciousness, I'm confused about their relationship to one another. Like, I'm not sure how subtle consciousness fits into that. Okay, okay. So the, Buddha, the, 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 the model in the Vajrayana tradition in Buddhism, which incidentally is the same model that the Tibetan medical system uses, posits that all consciousnesses, all sentient beings, all consciousnesses, all minds, have, are inextricably linked with their own set of the four elements, joined with, literally, their own set of the four elements, and that the physical world is made of the four elements, as we can see, you know? So the four elements is, 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 is what they're constructed of. So, this model says, what's your name? Alicia. Alicia, okay, is the name of the person who's got gross consciousness and gross physical body inextricably linked, which is all the Western world posits as existing as a person. You've got your nose, your body, your bones, all this stuff, right? Conjoined with your sensory consciousness. Would you agree? Your eyeballs, and so you have eye consciousness. Consciousness is not physical. Your mind is not physical. And that's linked inextricably with all the physical bits and pieces of you. So if the physical bits don't work properly, then the mind can't work properly. If your eyeballs have been gouged out, you can't see anything. Your eye consciousness can't function. If your ear ball goes deaf, your ear something goes deaf, you can't hear something. Consciousness is not physical, and it's the capacity to cognize. It, and the gross level, it's, it's, it's linked with inextricably the gross body. So as you go through the death process, that gross energy ceases. You stop, eventually stop breathing. That means the earth, the water, and the fire, and the air elements have ceased functioning in this, according to this model. And all the states of mind linked to those have ceased. And by the time you stop breathing, you've lost the plot. Your senses no longer work, but also you have no longer a sense of who you are. That's all finished. So the grosser level of your consciousness has ceased functioning. You now go to this subtler level, which is conjoined inextricably with a subtle physical energy. And according to this model, it, you've got, it's got three main components. There's the subtle nervous system, which is, they say, 72,000 subtle channels. It's, it's physical, but it's not visible to the eyes. It, inside those channels is coursing all the subtle wind energy, or prana, as they call it. And along with all that wind energy, inextricably linked to those winds are all the various subtler states of mind, including all our conceptual states of mind. It's a very different model. And those, they say the mind rides on the wind. So if your Tibetan doctor feels your pulses, she'll feel the imbalance of your wind energies. Like you've got a lot of, so she'll, and you've got massive anxiety, let's say. You know, you feel all tense in the heart and your breathing is unsteady and your mind's berserk. Well, the imbalance of those wind energies is completely connected to your attachment energy, your attachment mind, which is linked to those winds. And that's because that's what anxiety is about. So she'll give you some herbal medicine that'll calm the wind energy down, that'll help your mind calm down because they're inextricably linked. Subtle mind and subtle body, as they call it. So you keep coming more deconstructing, 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 until eventually everything in the body gathers at the heart chakra. All the wind energies go through all these channels, there are 72,000 of these channels, they all come to the heart chakra. 
And that's the very subtle consciousness, very subtle consciousness, the subtlest level of the conscious being of you, combined inextricably with a very subtle wind energy, which is, is all the grosser elements subsuming down to this subtle wind. The grosser consciousness is all subsuming down to this very subtle consciousness. And this is called the, this is, um, this is the subtlest level of your physical and mental energy. Okay? And then I talked about the death process. That's how they talk. So the only time we experience our subtle consciousness mostly is when we dream. That's our subtle consciousness. And we can see we've got no control, we go here, we go there, we have strange experiences, we have nightmares, that's subtle consciousness. And all it's doing is kind of bringing up different memories that are implanted in our mind that our grosser consciousness doesn't see or remember, you know. Are you communicating? That's the way they talk, that's the model. Thank you. Mm, someone else. Uh -huh. So I think we'll carry on about the compassion. Yes, yes, over here. And then we'll, ca we'll talk more about the compassion wing. I have a hard time understanding the exponential multiplication of karma. I don't mind purification. Talking. No, no, the exponential multiplication. Supposedly the karma multiplies. Yes. So I have no problem with white karma, but the black karma multiplication scares the hell out of me. I understand. <laughs> I know, I understand. So, but do, do you, I mean, if we understand this process, like I mentioned here, the simple process of practicing playing the piano, if we take the Buddhist explanation of that, that's your mind, remember, remembering all the theories, and then with your hands, having learned the theories, familiarizing yourself, your mind mostly, with the music. Would you agree? And if you do it every day, you get better and better and better at it. Would you agree with that? Yes. Well, that's karma, right? That's karma growing. The more you do something, the better you get at it. So, the more angry you get, the better you get at it. And the more angry you get, especially when you're having relationships, the more, the more dynamic the relationship is and the more likely you know, they're going to get angry with you. Even on a relative level, we can see this. So it is not, this, it is not the same karma from this one action that multiplies. What you mean is that it's a tendency that I have. In the, the way they action. talk about it, they say... I mean, you can say that this, 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 when you, you've got the... Okay, you've got the... Let's say you've got the tendency to be good at music but it's not manifesting yet. But then you, the, the tendency ripens, you get a teacher, and you start to practice. Well, you, the way they talk about it, all that practice you did for years and years comes from that one tendency ripening. Yes, so karma multiplies. So of course, when it gets abstract for us, because we can't see any evidence of that with our eyes, to think that one action of saving the life of, a, say, a person out of enormous compassion, how that one seed, as they call it, can grow and multiply and manifest as very, very, very many good rebirths. That seems more abstract. And that's the one you're talking about. I got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think, this, I think that reminds me also I should talk about the purification practice. Someone asked that. I want to do that. But I also want to talk about finishing more about the compassion wing in that time we've got left. So back to junior school briefly, okay? So the very first entry level into Buddhism is basically, you know, abiding by the laws of karma, meaning back off and don't harm sentient beings. He sort of, he gives us sort of seven general, you know, kind of bullet points. Three, refrain from killing, refrain from stealing, refrain from, you know, what they call sexual misconduct, jumping on the wrong person. In other words, refrain from doing the actions that are motivated by attachment and aversion, basically. Why? Because they will sow similar seeds in the mind that will ripen in the future as a tendency to keep doing it, as an experience similar to it, as an environmental result, and of course, crucially, as a type of rebirth, which would be a suffering one. So because one doesn't want suffering, one chooses to live this way. And then the last, th the next four are actions of the speech, for the same reason, like we talked this morning. And the last three, this is my way of putting it, are just the beginnings of Buddha 
getting us to begin to become familiar with our mind and he mentions the three root delusions but the kind of grosser aspects it seemed to me of attachment which is really powerful craving so he gets us to kind of control the really powerful levels of extra craving he gets us to control the really powerful extra levels of anger which is this kind of obsessive ill will want malice wanting people to suffer not just ordinary anger but not being able to let go of it and wishing that people suffered we can see the terrible heaviness of that kind of anger and then the grosser level of ignorance which becomes like stupidity and narrow-mindedness and fundamentalism and racism and sexism and that kind of thing. Very narrow-minded and fundamentalist. He is like getting us to start to harness the energy of these three. So those ten are his first level of practice, really. But then you can start, you know, if you decide to become a Buddhist, you then formally take refuge, formalize your commitment to the Buddha and his practices, the Sangha, the Dharma. And then secondly, you would then take the five lay person's vows which are extracted from those ten well four of them are extracted from the ten and there's one added so the killing the lying the sexual misconduct and the stealing are there and then a fifth one is added no intoxicants and one can take any or all of these five and one is you're committing yourself more powerfully here by taking a vow so in general a commitment is a decision to do something and a vow is a very powerful decision to refrain from doing something and buddha's really big on his vows you know very p they say that the vow and to live in the vows of morality as lama zopa says is is absolutely fundamental as we talked last wednesday or tuesday rubeche said you can have a person who's got a really good practice you know but doesn't have a vow not to kill just to kill whereas another person who merely is keeping their vows purely in particular the vow not to kill which is the main one when well, this is coming from lord buddha he's really big on vows you know he lama zopa said the second person who's merely keeping their vow not to kill because of the potency of vows that person is ticking over virtuous karmic seeds in their mind 24 hours a day and hugely purifying their mind so again this not might not be evident to us but it's really tasty you know and and, and i think there's some logic to it because what you do when you do take a vow you kneel in front of somebody you put your hands like this and you repeat three times that you vow from now until the time you die i will never kill i will never steal it's like you're making this huge decision you're kind of defining yourself as a moral person and you vowing that you will do this from here till the day you die so you're having this vow the way they talk about vows you know is very real is it like it feels like protection so somehow it seems logical and this is what they're saying in the teachings that when you've got that when you haven't got a vow not to kill let's you know first of all we need bucket loads of virtuous intentional karmic seeds of non-killing non-lying this very first level of morality junior school which is the level of the morality of restraint the first level is refrain from harming others we need bucket loads of those seeds those imprints in our minds so here we are sitting in this room right now not killing but if there's no intention not to kill if there's no thought saying i will not kill and of course there wouldn't be if there's no sentient being there to avoid killing so you know we we feel like we're nice people sitting here very holy and not killing anything but that's just because we've been virtuous in the past lives and we're not being attacked by somebody you know so that's not it's because of our past virtue so we're kind of resting on our laurels so what we need to accumulate in our mind stream is more of these really strong intentional decisions not to kill and the easiest way to do that is live in the vows not to kill because 24 hour, uh, hours a day like i said you've got them you're ticking over virtuous seeds and purifying 24 hours a day even without thinking about not killing and that's what they say buddha's teachings say that's the power of vows they in fact say in the text that vows themselves are this kind of they have this subtle form that's visible to clairvoyance so there you are you're, you're sort of you know you're making this powerful decision to define yourself as a virtuous person who will spend the rest of their life consciously not killing not lying i, I mean it's stupendous
And that obviously is more powerful than just not killing sometimes. You define yourself in that way. In just the same way you could argue that a person who commits to being a fisherman, it's like they're vowing to kill. They define themselves in terms of being a killer of fish rather than killing occasionally. It's obviously far more powerful for a person to have a profession as a killer than a person who kills occasionally because it's informing all their choices, what time they go to bed, what time they get up, how much they spend, what they do with their money. It's obviously much more pervasive in their mind. It's the same with a vow. Buddha's really into these. So the first lot is the five layperson's vows after you've taken refuge. So this is an amazing way, a very easy way to, as the way they talk in the teachings, to accumulate virtue and purify. This term of accumulating virtue or accumulating merit is just means putting lots of good f seeds in the ground. Every time you grow, sow the seeds, the veggies, the flowers and the herbs, that's creating merit. And every time you pull out the weeds, that's purifying. Just the terms they use, you know. And it's this dynamic process in your own mind. You're training your mind. Everything's about the mind. So, the next practice to do in junior school, and Lama Zopa Rinpoche says, we are insane not to do it every day. Why? Because every millisecond that we're existing, we are creating karma. Creating karma is what the mind does every second, merely by having thoughts and feelings and emotions and doing things with our body and speech. That's what we're doing every millisecond. It's a natural law. And it's dynamic, like weeds in the ground, like seeds in the ground. You, you know, you just, you put the seed in, you know the nature of the universe is that you've got a bit of soil, a bit of water, a bit of air, and it's going to explode into life. It, it expands. The Buddha talks about the mind like that. Energy expands, you know. It's not static. It's highly dynamic. So there's other practice that we can do that he says we're insane not to do every day. And it's in all the Tibetan traditions. It's in all the traditions. It's in the sutras. But it's been framed in a certain way in all the tr Tibetan traditions. And it's known as the four opponent powers. So the four R's is a good way to remember it. The first one, and there's a or different order it's taught very often, but this order I like, and the Lamas often use the analogy of, you know, having taken, eaten poison. So the very first step, if you've eaten poison, the first step has to be, oh my God, what an idiot, I can't believe what I just did. That's called regret. So as His Holiness so nicely said, and as I always quote, and it's really crucial to understand the difference, he said when he was asked what's the difference between guilt and regret, and he said guilt, which incidentally is a function of ego grasping, is when you, you, know, you say, you look in the past and you go, I did this and I did that and I did this, and then you go, and I'm a bad person. Now we're very familiar with that. Now, if you analyze that, it's, that's anger, but you're the object. Look at anger. You did this, and you did that, and you did this, and you're a bad person. So it's exactly the same state of mind. Guilt is anger. It's a delusion. It's a neurosis. But you're the object in this case. And we practically think it's virtuous, and we run like a magnet to it, because it's the natural way that ego grasping works. But he says, re regret is different. And we've got to cultivate this. It doesn't come naturally. So regret, he said, the, sa the first part's the same. You look into the past and you say, I did that, and I did this, and I did that. But then you have to say, but now what can I do about it? That's completely different. It's more proactive, it's confident, it's optimistic, and of course, the reason, the basis of why you would say, what can I do about it, is because you know, like eating poison, that it will cause you suffering. So of course, quick, what can I do about it? Where's the doctor? Whom can I turn to? That's regret. So that means, this is, this is what renunciation is. It's all kind of in this first step. It's actually recognizing that I have done actions that are labeled negative, which means to say an action that harms another based upon a delusion. And again, join the club here. And that imprint is in my mind. 
and there's no way in the universe like that poison that I want the suffering results. This is what we have to cultivate, this view about karma. It doesn't come naturally. We have to think it through, unpack it logically. Otherwise we just get into guilt and become, just use karma as a big stick to become even more neurotic. It's completely horrible, you know. So when you take the view that every negative action that you have done in the past will ripen as your suffering, then of course you're going to have regret. And that's what accountability is, that's what grown up is, that's what, re that's what re renunciation is. Oh my God, what a fool, I can't believe I've eaten that poison. So it naturally leads to whom can I turn to? Where's the doctor? So when you do this practice, of course, is a formal way of doing it. And you can sit at the end of the day, you can take stock of your day, and maybe you regret bad-mouthing the hubby and kicking the dog and, you know, killing your grandma, whatever you did, no idea. <laughs> the sooner you regret it, the better, because seeds multiply. So then you know, you, and, you and, and, and you really have to work on your mind because naturally we have this aching feeling of regret, especially in your close relationships. And you, you, you know, you, you're mean to your mummy yet again. You beat, you, you shout at your husband yet again. And we have, we have so much guilt naturally. It kind of, it, it kind of eats away at us, doesn't it? And part of that is terrified that he might give me up. So in a way, we, we, you know, it's sort of compassion. I mean, it's regret, but much of it is neurosis. Much of it is guilt, because I'm freaked and out that George is going to give me up, you know, because yet again I've shouted at him. So I can't wait to get home to apologise and beg him to forgive me. But my attachment is so desperate, and I'm looking in his eyes, and he, he says, it's all right, Rabin, I still love you. And I'm so relieved I've got off the hook again, you know. But that's not enough for the Buddha. That's why we often ask in the West, well, where's the forgiveness? But it's a very different philosophical model, forgiveness. Please hear the point. If you're a Christian, by definition, God, your creator, says don't kill. And if you kill, you create a sin because he said it's wrong. That's what defines it as a sin. So naturally, because he's the boss, you must ask him to forgive you. But that's our view in the world. You know, because I feel I'm a bad person, guilt, so I must rush off to George and please, George, please forgive me. It's okay, it's marvellous. Actually, it's fantastic to ask for forgiveness. It's very humbling. But it's not what the purification process in Buddhism is because Buddha is not a creator. Of course he will forgive you. He's a really nice person. But it's just not the issue. This is to do with you. This is your internal process. It's a huge point. Because just asking George to forgive me, you feel like you've been got off the hook. It's not enough. Until we do the fourth step, until we first regret, for my sake, because I'm sick of these suffering results and I don't want this to continue, and then you have compassion on the next step, I'll get into that, and the fourth one is you vow not to do it again. Until you do that internal process, nothing will change. I'll just badmouth him again tomorrow and, and one day the, it'll be the straw that bakes the camel back and he won't forgive me. And then you're freaking out. So it's got to be, you know, accountability. Regret is, I am sick of suffering. I do not want these suffering results. And you think it through. That's the basis of regret for your sake. Then whom can I turn to? Well, the doctor. Buddha is our doctor. And that's the relationship that we have with the Buddha in this context. Not as our creator. It's massively different. And not for forgiveness. It's irrelevant here. So we turn to the Buddha. Why? Because we've checked up on the doctor. There's two things in order before you, before you choose a doctor. One, you have to check up on their qualities and have confidence they're valid. But two, crucially, you've got to want their medicine, either preventative or curative. You just don't go to a doctor because he's got a cute nose, you know, unless you're looking for a partner. You go because you need their services. So you've got to be confident Buddha's a valid doctor. So then the second step is reliance and you turn to the doctor. And that means delighting that you found a decent doctor whose methods, called the Dharma, are what you will put into practice to heal your own rubbish. You rely upon the Buddha. You do the work. The second part of reliance is now where you have compassion. The first one's regret. It's like renunciation. This is now where you bring compassion in. And why is it called reliance? It's kind of curious. We don't think this way. Because the way the Tibetans are talking in this second step after refuge, I'm trying to cultivate compassion now for those I've harmed, and if I can, for those who've harmed me. This is the more advanced. So in that sense, 
I, I need suffering sentient beings, don't I? I have to rely upon suffering sentient beings. How can I cultivate compassion if there aren't any suffering sentient beings? So that's what they mean when they say you rely upon suffering sentient beings. And as Geshe Sopa said one time, bodhisattvas need their enemies. Best one. So in the second part, you now think of those you've harmed. Think of George and his suffering. Think of others. And then, of course, when you do this process, you can, if you're really doing it properly as a Buddhist, after you've thought of the normal things in the day, you'd then think of anything you've ever done since beginning this time with your body and speech to harm any sentient being at all, which you regret from the depths of your heart because I do not want the future suffering. You've got to get that one down. We say this practice every day. We just kind of mouth the words, oh, I regret, blah, 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 you know. It's not strong enough. It's got to be renunciation. And then compassion, you think about the second one, those you've harmed. And then if you're brave enough, think of all those who've harmed you. I must, I regret for their sake. And I, have, I must purify for their sake. Now you have compassion. The third step, you take the remedy. So as we know in the Tibetan tradition, all the lamas and all the traditions love this third practice, which is this formal way of visualizing a particular Buddha called Vajrasattva and reciting his mantra. It's the one that all the traditions use for general powerful purification medicine, if you like, you know. I mean, any, this third one is often called the antidote. So anything in general that's opposite to the thing you're regretting is a good antidote, clearly. So in your daily life, of course, if you regret killing, it's really good to go and save lives as the antidote to help sick people. There's a great antidote, it's obvious, it's directly opposite. But this particular practice of visualizing Vajrasattva, I'll explain, and reciting his mantra is said to be a really potent medicine to help purify at the root, you know, weaken the negative seeds. Then the fourth one, as, Lama, as Pabonka Rinpoche says, the most important. It's, it's uh, re, uh, what's, it? what's the first? Resolve. Resolve. So it's a way to remember. They're called different things, but determination to change. This is a crucial one. You know, Lama Zopa says regret is the main first one. If you don't acknowledge that you did that thing and deeply regret it because you don't want the suffering, you don't do the rest. And if you don't have the regret, you cannot have resolve, a decision to change. So as long as I says, you don't lie to yourself and just kind of, oh, I'll never badmouth George again when it's your worst habit. But you, be, you really talk yourself through. You be realistic and give yourself a timeline. So this process for me is so beneficial if we do it properly, not just mouth the words if we've taken the initiation to Vajrasattva, oh, I've done my Vajrasattva practice, blah, 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 a few mantras. No, you've got to do each step because each step has a specific function. And it's really like, for me, it sounds a bit corny, but it's like becoming your own friend. And if you look at yourself, we tend not to talk very nicely to ourselves. We're always either constantly putting ourselves down, constantly thinking we're hopeless and no good, or feeling all injured and offended. If we do think of any good qualities we've got, we're usually thinking of how nobody sees my good qualities and it's not fair and I'm better than they think. They're never wholesome and virtuous, you know. We're always kind of injured how we talk to ourselves. So this process is really powerful to kind of becoming your own civilized friend, you know, becoming accountable. And you relax in a chair, put your feet up. I don't care, don't look holy. Just, it's like a psychological process, you know. It's you thinking a process through your mind changing. Don't think of it as religious. It's so important. Regretting, because you're sick of suffering. Refuge. Be delighted you got a Buddha. Be so happy, kind of cheers, great. I'm so happy to have you. Wow, imagine finding a Buddha, amazing, thank you, great. That's good refuge. That's a nice refuge prayer, that one. Wow, amazing, great. Or like Lama Zopa, wow, 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 you know. <laughs> and then you have compassion. Genuine, you think it through, you know. Make it real. Third one is you recite, you're about to suffer. You visualize. You visualize neck to come in, like a similar type of thing we did this morning, variation on that. So very often we'll go, well, how does that help? Visualizing light coming. Well, guess what? As Lama Yeshi says, it's your mind that creates negativity. It's your, and it's your mind that purifies it by creating positivity. Whatever your mind does brings results. So if your mind is sitting like we did this morning, visualizing a Buddha, imagining purifying, imagining, I mean, you're doing exactly that. What else is negativity but an imprint in your mind? 
But we tend to think it's so inherent. We think negativity is inherent. And like we're talking about the mouse in the conversation with Jane, no, killing a mouse is not inherent. It can't be. It's a dependent arising like everything else, which means it too is empty of existing from its own side as inherently bad. Everything is. So it's really powerful to see when we understand that, that just visualizing. And as Rinpoche says, you know, in, in Buddhist words, the more faith you have, well, faith means confidence. Look at the Latin word, confidence, confide, with faith. That's what it means. It means confidence. We all know the more confidently you do something, the better you do it. It's not rocket science. If you drive the car like a little mouse, you're going to make a mess. If you drive the car confidently, you'll be successful. Well, if you strongly imagine purifying, strongly regret, strongly determined to change, guess what? It's your mind doing it, baby. That's what purification is. It's your mind engaging wholesomely, confidently in each of these steps. It's not some religious thing of out there, someone Buddha will make you nice, you know? Nothing like that. It's you who does it. I mean, Buddha's dying to help. We just got to have confidence using their tools, you know. So you make decisions. I will not, you know, I won't, you might say, I will not badmouth George for 10 hours. And guess what? You'll be snoring asleep. You will keep your vow. (laughs) Then maybe the next day you can say 15. Eventually you'll be able to say, I will never badmouth George again. It's like anything you practice until you make perfect. But you've got to be realistic with yourself. That is all guilty, you know. It's a logical process, and this is how we create karma. So we create karma with the mind, and we create, purify the karma. It's the same, no difference. And the point is with this process, it's chipping away, if you like. It's chipping away at the negative imprints. It's sort of gradually chipping away at the root. But you won't uproot all negative karmic imprints until you've realized emptiness. (coughs) That's the final purification. And that's why Vajrasattva is said to be so potent. So, okay, who's Vajrasattva? Well, you've got Buddha, okay? Bare bones Buddha. What that refers to, that word, is the all-pervasive, all-knowing, all-compassion, all-powerful, unmanifest consciousness, enlightened consciousness. And billions of, millions of, who knows, beings have become a Buddha. That's the meaning of the word Buddha. They call that absolute Buddha, if you like. Now you've got relative Buddha, which is the bodies that that mind manifests in to benefit sentient beings. So you've got Buddha, like a little family tree business, you've got Buddha, then you've got down, and you have two kinds of bodies. One is known as the emanation body, which is a regular body that you and I can see. So we could say there, the Buddha in this aspect (coughs) is Mr. Shakyamuni Buddha of two and a half thousand years ago, the monk, this sadhu who became, you know, a Buddha. He's our relative Buddha in sutra teachings. In tantra teachings, the boss Buddha is called Vajradhara. Different traditions, they call different things. So I remember when I first met the Dharma and I was editing all the teachings and typing away and I kept coming up with this name called Doji Chung. And then I came up with this name called Vajradhara and I kind of liked him. I didn't know who he was. And then I discovered he's the same bloke. You know, I was really happy. I remember asking Lama Yeshi, Lama, who's who's Doji Chung? He said, he's the biggest Buddha dear. Well, I was very proud that I liked the biggest Buddha, you know. That's my main memory of it, of course. And Lama being so marvellous, not some fancy intellectual answer, but a really cute answer, the biggest Buddha dear. So one, I'll never forget it as long as I live. So basically, you, you've got the family tree, you've got absolute Buddha, then down to the forms, Shakyamuni, you've got Vajradhara, and you go to the side, and then you've got Vajrasattva. He's a white version of the biggest Buddha dear, because the biggest Buddha of Vajradhara is blue, and Vajrasattva is a white version of him. He's like the boss Buddha in Tantra. And he's, and, and he's especially pa- used powerfully for purification because he's to do with emptiness. And emptiness is the thing that cuts the root of all delusions. So underneath Vajradhara, you then have the five Buddha families. And they're all just representations of different psychological states. It's all psychology. All this stuff is psychology, surprisingly to us. So the five Buddha families, Amitabha, 
He's red, blue, Akshobi, Avadra, Vero, China, the five of them, Amoga City, Ratna, Sambhava. And they all represent either a quality that we're trying to cultivate or they represent a delusion we're trying to purify. Either way, the same. That under those five Buddha families are all the other millions of Buddhas. Male ones, female ones, cute ones, rough ones, peaceful ones, wrathful ones, all kinds. And they all are manifestations of different psychological qualities that we either want to get rid of or we want to enhance. It's basically psychology. This is Vajrayana, Tantra. So Vajrasattva is really tasty for purification because it's related to emptiness. And that's the main purification. And why is this? Ego grasping, the root delusion, which is the source of all attachment, all anger, all pride, therefore all killing, all lying, all, sex, all sexual misconduct, all stealing, and everything else. Because the body and the mind, let's face it, are just the servants of our mind, aren't they? So you put your hand out and give $20, that's generosity. Your hand does the job of the mind, which is called generosity. Your hand goes out and stabs. Your hand does the job of ac acting out anger's wishes. So the first level of practice is to control your behavior. Don't do the bad actions. Then it's to control the delusions. So attachment and anger, jealousy and pride are all, as I said, like I like to call them the voices of the root <coughs> delusion. The one that assumes the presence of the self-existent me. This is the one that keeps the motor of samsara going for eternity. This is the one that has to finally be cut out. So we can, the grosser level of suffering like we talked before, you first refrain from doing the negative actions with your body and speech. So that stops the grosser level of suffering happening. <coughs> the bad things happening, the lower realms and the bad things happening. Then you get to high school and you start to deal with the delusions and you quit attachment and anger and all the other junk and that which is the source of why you do bad things. And you're really getting ahead of the game now. But until, and that'll cause you to have nice rebirths. You can be in the God realms for eons and be blissful and be in the form realms, but you haven't cut the root of samsara yet. You've still got the seed that can continue to ripen as rebirths. And because you haven't cut the root of samsara, the root delusion, the grasping and inherent me, you'll have lots of good rebirths, but that karma will run out. And then your other karmic seeds, because they're not all purified yet, they will start ripening and get animal realms again and suffering realms, and off you go again, round and round and round. So far, when you've cut, when you've realised emptiness, which means you no longer buy into the view of an inherent I, then you cut the root. You've cut that misconception. The others can't grow anymore. So that's the end, the beginning of the end of suffering. You've got more work to do to perfect it. But from, like I said, from the second you have your first moment of direct, as they call it, direct, non-conceptual, genuine insight into emptiness. The first second of that, you become, you're kind of climbing out of samsara and proceeding into nirvana. You can't fall back from there. You've now cut the root. You've cut the root. And then we have to perfect that realization. So even more practical, if we think about how can we, what does it mean by cut the root? It's a nice analogy, you know. Well, if we understand this point that I've been emphasizing, which is so crucial if we want to understand Buddhist psychology, that all these delusions are misconceptions. They're basically wrong thoughts, which is shocking to us, like I said, because we're only familiar with the feelings. But when we get down ever deep into our mind, we can hear the crystal clear elaborate elaborations, these conceptual elaborations, these lies. So we first have to cut the grosser lies. Stop believing in attachment story. Stop believing in anger story. But eventually we have to stop believing in the root delusion story, which is the real self-existent inherent me in the first place. So when we understand they're all misconceptions, we can understand theoretically how you can stop believing a wrong thought. How you can remove a misconception from your mind.
So if I say to you, you know, if I happen to say to you, oh, that's, you know, um, you know, that's red. And you say, don't be silly, Rabina. It's black. And I go, oops, you're absolutely right. It's black. It's possible, isn't it? I made a mistake. So you would agree, first of all, would you not, that that is black is a thought, yeah? It's a, it's a conception, isn't it? And that is red is also a conception. Isn't it? It's a thought, it's a conception, you agree? It's obvious. One is a correct conception according to conventional truth because we've all agreed that's black. And the other one is a lie. We've all agreed that that is not red. So there's a conception that says that is black. That's a correct conception. There's a conception that says that is red. That's a misconception. It's not true. So, you know, you say to me, don't be silly, Rabina, it's red. And I'm not clinging to my misconception. I just made a quick mistake. So I say, you're absolutely right. It's black. So what happened to the thought? It is red. What's happened to it? Gone. From where? Emptiness what? What, darling? No, that's a different discussion. That's a different discussion. That's a different discussion. This one is simply fixing a mistake. So it's gone. You, somebody said it's gone, right? Gone from where? From my mind, isn't it? So, that's, so then we've just proven it's possible to remove a misconception from our mind. Yeah. Can you see that? Yeah. And what made it go? Seeing, it. Seeing the truth. You, you hear what I'm saying? Can you hear that? Yes. Seeing the truth caused the lie to disappear into thin air, gone. You understand? So the certainty of the truth is what annihilates the lies. So that's what we have to do with the delusions. Right now we're addicted to all these lies, have been for eons, Buddha says. We believe their stories. We believe them one trillion percent. And as Lama Zopa says, as Buddha says, we believed in these lies for so long, and this is the tragedy, that now everything out there appears to us in the aspect of those lies. In other words, you believe that this is red for so long, it actually appears red to you. Now then it's really hard to change, isn't it? Because it appears red. And that's what Buddha's saying. For eons, all these lies in our mind, starting with ego grasping that believes in the lie of an inherent me, Everything, and as well as everything else, everything in the universe appears, this is what I understand with Buddhist psychology, it's so fascinating. Everything in the world appears to us, as, was, as they say in the teachings, in the aspect of whatever's in our mind. We know this. If I'm furious with George, if I'm angry, if anger is in my mind, it's obvious that George appears ugly to me. We know that. If I'm in love with George, we know that George will look completely divine. We know this, but we don't join the dots. This should make us realize emptiness. Meaning my habit of attachment, this is what Buddha is saying, causes George to look divine. And my anger causes him to look disgusting. And then the trouble is, as Lama Zopa says, bad enough that George appears to me wrongly because he doesn't exist like that. But the worst thing is, I believe it's true. That's the worst part of samsara. We believe in the lies that our mind tells us because we've been telling them for so long, everything appears delicious if attachment is there, appears ugly if anger is there, and of course the root one appears self-existent, and that is so abstract for us. Everything appears to us as having an inherent nature. We don't even know what it means. This is why I have to give it such thought. So we believe we're sucked in every time to these lies. So the first one, as Lama Zopa says, we've got to stop believing in our karmic appearances, which is why it's so stupendously hard, because we're addicted to our views. And then our views inform what's out there, and as Lama Zopa says, it appears back to us like that. So we're completely just bought, buying into the bullshit, you know, utterly. It's a, it's a terror of samsara. So, we've got to cut 
we've got to start arguing which each, which these, each of the lies, which is really, really difficult. When I'm in the, th in the throes of bliss as a result of being in love with George, to sit there and do an analytical meditation and use wisdom to argue with attachment, which has completely gone berserk, and to, to, to discuss with attachment how it's gone nuts and it's not seeing the truth. That who wants even to do that? Nobody. We don't want it. We, we, we want to believe in the divine George. And then, of course, when you're really angry with George, it's almost impossible to argue with anger and wisdom describing to anger your two roommates chatting away. Anger doesn't want to listen. Anger wants to believe he's a creep. Everything about anger is pointing the finger and is dying to blame. It's an addiction of anger. So to use wisdom to argue with it takes enormous courage. And the argument is to try to show that part of the mind called anger, that roommate, how it has not got the correct view of George. It is exaggerating George's ugliness. This is really hard to do. So, to argue, use wisdom to argue with the root delusion that thinks I and everything else is inherent, this really takes some hard work. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a logical job, not mystical, not cross your fingers. It needs much rigour, much wisdom, much discipline. And this is where, this again really gets us so confused, you know, when we think about Tibetan Buddhists especially, where they've got so much religion, it's like coming out your ears, you know, isn't it? Prayers and prostrations and water bowls and mantras and visualising and this one and, and, and mandalas and drums and bells, and I mean, it's like unbelievable bells and whistles. And many people just can't stand it and love to go to the Zen centre or where you can go and watch your breath, you know. Because it seems so complicated. What is, and I know when I first started hearing Lama Zopa, when I first met him, I thought, what is he talking about? I was drowning in confusion, you know. So the, the really helpful way for me to think about it is like this. Okay. As I said before, I have said a few times, you don't really, you know, okay, to really get on track with being a Buddhist, actually, is when you start to be your own therapist. That's Buddha's unique approach. And from here to enlightenment, that is what you're doing. You're arguing with the delusions, stopping believing in them, and then growing the virtues. That's what becoming a Buddha entails. That's the job. It sounds wonderful. That's the job. It's, it's easy to understand it, like we've been talking. But it's immensely difficult to do that because our minds aren't prepared. Our minds aren't primed for the job. So it's a bit like I like the analogy. I always use the same one. I've got to come up with some new examples. But, you know, Michael, I watched Michael Jordan play basketball, for example. I know he's probably a grandfather by now. He hasn't played for 20 years, but whatever. So I like to say I watched Michael Jordan and he gets all the balls in the hoop, doesn't he? And so you know logically, you know that, you know, basketball is get, the bottom line is getting the ball in the hoop isn't it that's the bottom line the biggest number wins you know so when you watch these dudes up and down the you think oh this is amazing god it's so easy this guy from the other end flying the balls in the hoop and then you go please michael show me how to get the ball in the hoop well they'll say to rabina go lose 50 years for a start then go lose 20 kilos and do this and go to university for two years and learn the theories of basketball. And then play with teams and do lots of jogging and eat this food and do that. And I'll say, oh no, Michael, you didn't, you didn't hear me. How do I get the ball in the hoop? And he'll repeat himself. So we know it's true. If I tried to walk onto the ball, the court now, and get balls in hoops like Michael Jordan, we know we'd be pathetic failure because your body and mind aren't ready for it. Now, th all those practices that he gave me for two years to do, five years to do, to get myself ready to effortlessly get the ball in the hoop, which is the point of basketball, that's what all those so-called preliminary practices are all about. All the nundro, as they call them, preliminary practices, all the prostrations and all the water bowls and all the, what they call practices that help us purify negative karma at a very deep level and create virtue, meaning priming our mind so that it can be capable and ready to see the delusions and realise emptiness. Because that's what the job of being a Buddhist is. That's where they fit in. Are you with me, people? You sure? 
So then the extent to which we do all that stuff, and that initially it just seems like religion to us, that we've got to think about the meaning, you know, because, because the mind is so stubborn, because we're so obsessed with these, uh, the views we have now, because we're completely addicted to all these views for eons, Buddha says, you've got to use radical methods like atomic bombs on the stuff at a very deep level to loosen the yuck at the depth of everything, to, to kind of loosen it, you know. That's why living in vows is a fundamental first step. Buddha Lama Zopa says you just cannot get ahead of the game. Just being a nice person is not enough. Because why? 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 Because the key factor, like we talked, that determines the character of the karma we create is the motivation. So right now, emptiness and, uh, okay, emptiness and bodhicitta are the two best motivations. They're the key. Wisdom and compassion. They're the best. Top. Top dogs. But who's got wisdom and who's got compassion? We're pathetic, we're weak as anything, you know. Attachment is our main, does run as a show. So we, our, because our attachment, because our emptiness and bodhicitta are so weak, our motivation for doing good things is very weak. It's mainly attachment, attachment to reputation, attachment to comfort. I mean, that's just how we are, not to feel depressed about it. So it's, it's not enough just to do good actions every now and again. We've got, to, whereas we live in vows, they are, themselves are like an atomic bomb on all the delusions at a deep level. And because you're ticking over virtue 24 hours a day and purifying 24 hours a day, you can get ahead of the game. As Lama Zoba says, it is absolutely likely that the cause, the karma that we created, that triggered, was triggered at the time of our past death that got us into this life, was practiced in the context of vows. It gives it so much potency. So it's like, it's like foolish not to have vows. Don't just think of it as some superstitious thing that only the galupas do. Many people think that. It's in all the Buddhist tradition. They're coming from the Hinayana, you know. Then you've got the Bodhisattva vows, even more amazing, more marvelous. And then, of course, you have the Vajrayana vows if you enter into that level of practice. Huge, vast. So keeping your vows, they all say in the Vajrayana, you keep your vows, you begin enlightened in like 14 lives or something, you know. So keeping your vows is a, is a trouble. So that's one thing. The other one is the purification practice getting ahead of the game at the end of every day, four hours. It's like doing your weeding at the end of the day, you know. You live in vows, then you take your body bodhisattva on top. This is like a huge b b a boost to all the virtue we do practice on the basis of living in vows. And this is Buddhist teaching, said to be so potent, so marvelous, you know. So then we can start, and then of course all the other practices like the nundros and the, 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 the prostrations and the water bowls and the devotion, all this drama, you know. Why don't we get used to it? Because it's quite complex. And we can see the logic of it, we're ha we'll do it happily, with confidence. And remember too, the crucial point, as Lama Tsongkhapa says in his Hymns of Experience, this lovely, lovely, sweet, poetic Lamrim text, all the teachings are to be taken as sound advice because there is, because there is no contradiction between scripture <coughs> and practice. And what that means is, if the teachings are valid, that has to be the assumption. There's not a single syllable of those teachings that can't be practiced. If there is, then it's not Dharma. It's a load of rubbish. In other words, you know, that's like saying in that cookbook, all the words in this book are to be taken as sound advice because there's no contradiction between the recipe and the cake. That's logical. If there's anything in that book that doesn't help you make a cake, then you can get your money back. Well, if there's any teaching in Buddhism that isn't practical, that doesn't finally help you become a Buddha, it is a load of garbage and you must chuck it out and throw it right back to the people who gave it to you. It's inauthentic. It's incredibly important to take that on board as a, as a hypothesis. And then you have to check carefully. So, of course, if there are some practices you can't see the logic of, then put them on the back burner. Leave it. Relax, you know. So that's why it's got nothing to do with being a ritual. The commonest thing is all these Tibetan rituals. What good is a ritual? Well, excuse me, you know, what's a ritual? If George is a Tibetan and I walk up to him and I stick my hand out like this, hello, George, and he, look, he goes, he's never heard of shaking hands. So I give him my hand aggressively and he takes it and kind of all wimpy, you know. I think, oh, what a pathetic handshake. Because the man's never heard of a handshake. It's a ritual, okay? And when you buy into the meaning, then we all know what it means. Well, everything's a ritual. Walking, going to the toilet, eating our food, shaking hands, sleeping, lying, whatever. It's all ritual because it's all empty because it's all dependent on arising. It's got meaning that we give it. 
then water bowls have meaning if you give it a deity, a mandala set, anything. To be, whatever you do, it's got meaning. If you give it meaning, you buy into that meaning, it becomes that for you. It proves emptiness. So if there is a thing that's merely ritual, which means it doesn't have meaning, then you're being superstitious. Don't be ridiculous. Any questions? Yeah, about purification or whatever? Yes, somebody, yes. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. Uh, you said this phrase, um, emptiness as motivation. Sorry, what? You said the phrase, to use emptiness as motivation. No, I didn't say that. I said, what I said is before, that the main, the best motivations that inform our actions to make them most potent is the realize, is our understanding of emptiness and our bodhicitta. They're the best motivations to have for all our actions. But because we don't have much wisdom, because we don't understand emptiness, and because we don't have much bodhicitta, therefore most of the time our actions of virtue are quite weak. That's what I said. I see. But um, the concept of emptiness, how to not slip in that... Um in the wrong meaning of it. I can't, I'm sorry, darling. What? How to not slip in the wrong meaning of emptiness? Um, for example, like if anything only has meaning if we give it to it, then if we just collectively decide to not give meaning to anything, then it's no. Just that, that's nihilism. More, that's like, not what. No, that's, to, that's nihilism. The point is, the crucial point to get, as Lama Tsongkhapa says. There is no meaning in the cup that we haven't given it. it. Means it's empty of existing without depending on the mind. So if you just leave it there, then what you're saying is right. But no, you see, because relatively it does function as a cup exactly as we stated. So it can't just, it can't become nihilistic. It functions as a cup, it holds my tea, right? So there's not one atom from the cup that makes it that cup, but nevertheless it does function. That's the two we have to put together. So then you can never be nihilistic out of that. You can't just say, oh, nothing's anything and anything's whatever you like. No. I see. You have to think about it, but that's what they say. Thank you. And my second question is, um, what is the definition of nirvana? It's not one of the <coughs> realms. It's something that comes what? after. Not what? Not one of the realms. Not what? I know, but not what, darling? Realms. Sorry. Okay, good. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes. Okay, nirvana. I think it means cessation, doesn't it? What it's referring to, when you've achieved your nirvana, what it's referring to is that you have realized emptiness and perfected that realization. And you now have cut the seeds of all suffering and rebirth. So you've got further to go, you've got, you can become a Buddha, which means you've got to work further, but you've cut the root of samsara, you've cut the root of um, rebirth, you won't get reborn again. You won't need to get reborn in ordinary realms of existence. That's when you've achieved your own liberation, your, your cessation of suffering and its causes. That's what it's referring to. It's not a place, it's a state of mind. When you've realized emptiness, you've achieved, perfected it and achieved liberation from samsara, you've quit the suffering and its causes, that's when you've achieved your personal nirvana, which means you won't need to be reborn again. And then, um, so the consciousness is not going to be reborn again, but where it goes? Or? Yes, consciousness stays in a subtle state of bliss until Buddha comes along and taps you on the shoulder and says, okay, honey, come out of this bliss now and get onto the Mahayana path so you can become a Buddha so you can help benefit sentient beings. Thank you. All right. That's what they say. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yes. As always, thank you for teaching so much. Um, can you discuss the 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 difference between uh, Vajradhara and a primordial Buddha and the Hindu notion of Brahma or God? Well, I don't know. What's the primordial Buddha mean? That's a Kagyu statement. Isn't that like they're talking about Samantabhadra or something? What do you mean by it? Yeah, a, a Buddha that exists uh, th 
like that ex- that continually exist, or just but even the idea wouldn't. of big boss okay. Buddha. There's these different phrases in different traditions. They talk in different ways. Yeah, you know. But basically, the, the any of the ones in Buddhism, the word Buddha is the term used to refer. Let's say when you've achieved it, because we can all achieve it. You've achi- when you've achieved that, the word Buddha refers to your consciousness, which is not physical. Remember, mm-hmm. that is necessarily pervading wherever there is existence. Now, if you think about it, your consciousness is not physical, right? And right now, it's locked into this body of ours because we've got so many delusions and we're just stuck in this body because of attachment. But as you progress and you, you, know, you lessen the delusions and grow your virtues, eventually you reach perfection. There's nowhere your mind can't be. How can it? If it's not physical, how can it be confined by space or time or matter? So your Buddha mind pervades wherever there exists, first of all. Second, it has the quality of omniscience. It knows that which exists without mistake. Buddha would say, by definition, every mind has that potential to know that which exists. Third, this mind, this Buddha mind, has infinite compassion, infinite empathy with others, such that there's no longer a separate sense of self at all. It's like your sense of self is as big as the universe, encompassing every sentient being, because even the idea of a separate self which is what we all believe in, is a complete delusion, Buddha says. It's a complete fabrication. It's because of ego grasping. We have all these millions of cells running around butting heads, you know. And you have third quality. You have the effortless power, effortless power, to manifest that consciousness of yours in as many forms, millions of forms, throughout all the universes, for as long as time exists, to benefit every sentient being perfectly. That's a Buddha. Every sentient being has the potential to become that. Now, God or Brahma is, you could argue, has some of those characteristics. That's how they say it. But it doesn't have a cause. It didn't be, wasn't an ordinary being that became a Buddha. That's kind of shocking to the people who have that view. It is necessarily above and beyond, is not dependent or rising, has, is not the product of causes, but does indeed have power, but is the, but is the cause of the universe and is the boss and punishes and rewards. So that's a different interpretation, if you like. You could argue there's some similarity there. Do you see what I'm saying? I do, thank you. Okay. So all Buddhas are primordial in the sense that, you know, once you're a Buddha, I mean, mind is beginningless and endless anyway. And once you become a Buddha, you've cut the root of all delusions, so you can never become samsaric again, and the mind can never end. And your job is to benefit sentient beings. You bop around manifesting everywhere, having fun, helping sentient beings. In the hell realms, in the spirit realms, in the god realms, in the animal realms, that dog over there. There's a lovely story about his holiness. I love to tell this story. Lama Zopa told this story years ago up at Laudo, his place up in the cave, up in the, mon- up in the mountains. And he's, it was a story he told us in 1979 about the time when, the, I always tell this story, about the Tibetans when they first came out of Tibet to India. And in the early 60s, His Holiness was already in Dharamsala with his exiled government and they were negotiating with the Indian government to get all these hundreds of thousands of acres way down south forest that the Indian government so kindly offered to the Tibetans, you know. It's incredible, really. It's a poor country, you know. So then they were negotiating and His Holiness had sent down his appropriate Tibetan minister to discuss with the Indian minister. And of course, I think the first time he went down, he couldn't get a meeting. He got frustrated, went back up to Dharamsala, you know, 12 hours up the mountains. And His Holiness says, don't you worry, it'll be okay. Go back down to Delhi again. So he went down. That's where the government is. So that particular day, apparently, the little boy, the son of the Indian minister, was in the office with his daddy. And the little boy was chatting to the Tibetan and he asked, he said he wanted a dog. Well, the Tibetan was delighted to grease the wheels. Oh, I'll get you a dog, he said, you know. So he goes outside and there's a sadhu with a little dog. Well, can I buy your dog? Yes, he bought the dog. So he gave the dog to the little boy. The little boy's happy. He runs to his daddy. Daddy's happy. And all the wheels are greased and everything works, you know. Well, as Lama Zopa says, the story is that the dog and the sadhu were manifestations of the Dalai Lama's mind. So, okay. If the Dalai Lama is who he is said to be, that is to say a Buddha, I can't tell. I mean, he's a nice guy, I like him. A nice holy guy. But I can't say he's a Buddha, unless you're enlightened, you can't say. But all the people I respect say he is, so that's good enough. It'll do me, you know, it'll do for now. But the point is, if he is a Buddha, you know, that means that even the Dalai Lama's body is just a man- is one manifestation 
of that Buddha mind. And, and that means he's manifesting trillions of bodies simultaneously right this second. A Buddha could not do anything else because they're so overwhelmed by compassion and this power. So even the lowest level Bodhisattva, and there are ten stages of Bodhicitta to get to Buddhahood, the lowest level Bodhisattva can already manifest their mind in a hundred forms simultaneously. That's what I mean about Bodhicitta, it's kind of outrageous, you know. So there's this Dalai Lama, the Buddha, they say, manifesting as a sadhu. Now that sadhu didn't have to come out of a womb. He can manifest as a sadhu anywhere he likes. He manifests as dog. And the point is, you know, we all think, everyone thinks their dog and their cat is a little Buddha. Oh, my dog lover is so special, will come to meditate, blah, 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 you know, whatever. But the point is, you can never tell, you can't tell, we can't even tell who Buddha is. We all think we're so clever knowing who Buddha is. You know, the nice monk with a little bonk in his head. You know, where is he? There he is. That one. But I mean, you go back two, two and a half thousand years ago, get to India, the place was crawling in sadhus. You wouldn't know one from another these Indian blokes with their yellow robes on. You couldn't have told, oh, there's the Buddha. You wouldn't know one from another. So, you know, we have to have confidence. That's why we've got to check up. You can't tell who anybody is. How can we tell? That's why when they talk about getting a teacher now, it's the same as Buddha's time. There's no difference. You could not tell that he was a Buddha. No way. We can see statues now, but who cares? You know, you'd never recognize him in person. So we've got to check on his qualities, check on his things, check whether he's valid. So we have confidence that could be a Buddha. So anyway, the Dalai Lama, we all say, oh yeah, he's a Buddha, wow, he's a Buddha far out, you know. Well, how do you know? Like I like to say, don't be shocked, if suddenly he disrobes and gets a young girlfriend, I think 95% of everybody will give him up. Be so shocked, this old man with a young girl, you know. He will have the worst, you know, um, reputation on the earth. He'll be shocked, there'll be uproar. I'm just saying that because we can't tell who a Buddha is, how do we know anything? The fifth Dalai Lama was wonderful. The lovely story about the fifth Dalai Lama. There's, apparently, the, you know, the, when you're a Dalai Lama, you get the whole, because that was the politics, you know, they were the king, the boss. So they had their own regime, their own uh, administration. So when the administration changes, when one, one dies, they've got to get changed administration. Well, the, all the administration, like they called it that, whatever, of the fifth were nervous. The, the, the portala, which they were in the middle of building, wouldn't get finished if they changed changed hands, you know, so they pretended the fifth Dalai Lama was in meditation. In fact, he was dead. So then by the time they finished the Potala, then they announced, but by that point, the, the sixth Dalai Lama was born, he was like 11 years old, and they kind of lost him, you know. So he, apparently, he didn't want to be a monk. So he, used to, he, was, he shows the aspect of being like this tantric yogi. There's all these beautiful love poetry he writes, this gorgeous Vajrayana tantric poetry. He'd hang out with the prostitutes, you know. He'd be manifesting over here and over there. The Tibetans loved him because they had confidence. They didn't care. He loved the, the prostitutes. They, as far as they're concerned, he's the Buddha. He can do what he likes, you know. So they, even though they can't tell by looking, they had confidence he was the Buddha. So anyway, there's the Dalai Lama manifesting as a dog. Now believe me, you could not tell that dog was a Buddha. I promise. It might have even been a mean, ugly, aggressive dog. Just because the Buddha doesn't mean it's cute and nice. So maybe, you know, it would have been a mean dog and bite at your ankles. You don't know that. So, you know, it wouldn't be sitting, like I say, it wouldn't be sitting in the corner winking at you. I'm really the Dalai Lama, you know. <laughs> no. You couldn't tell. He would look like a dog, he'd eat like a dog, he'd pee like a dog, and he'd die like a dog. And it's the same with the Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama is not, a, if he's a Buddha, he is not a human being. Human being, he doesn't need a bag of bones with piss and shit in it like we do. He doesn't need one of them. God help me, he's gone way past that. It's out of his compassion that he manifests as a nice looking handsome Tibetan monk. Or a dog, or a sadhu for that matter. That's why we have to understand these words. And this is from the Bodhisattva teachings, you know. Because the Bodhisattva teachings also say, if you can be a dog, then you can also be a thief. And this is really intense, when the motivation one really kinks in. You know, bodhisattvas have the power to do whatever they like because they have such immovable compassion and, uh, depending on what the level, realizations of emptiness. So they can even do negative things. Now, who can tell? Who can see what's negative, what's positive? If we go by the behavior, we can't tell anything. So it's so important to understand the different levels of the teachings and especially to study the Mahayana teachings. Was that the story I wanted to tell you? It was, I don't know. Why did I say that? Buddha. Oh, your, your question. Yeah, right. Okay. How are we going? Well, I just want to talk about the compassion wing. Well, I sort of am, aren't I? I talk about the compassion wing. So, um, okay. Let's finish. We've got half an hour to finish. I'm sorry to shortchange you, but we've got to go early. I've got to get to the 
I'm going to the Appalachians. Have you ever been to the Appalachians before? Isn't that the white section of Kentucky, isn't it? Oh no, oh, it's not white, I don't know. I thought that's all the poor whites live in the Appalachians, I heard. I don't know, they sing hill, don't they, the hillbillies? Don't say that. I'm being <laughs> I'm going around, there's a university there, a Christian gentleman has invited me to give two talks. But first I go to Nashville, and then I fly, and then I drive to Eddyville in Kentucky to see my friend Mitch on death row. And then we get up, at, I've got my friend coming to drive me because I, I don't like driving anymore, I get too many speeding tickets. So my friend John is coming to drive me the six hours to Pikeville, it's called Pikeville. So anyway, I've got to fly there tonight. So, um, where were we? Okay. Compassion, okay. So there's many ways of talking about compassion, but this verse, as I was telling you, is, you know, one, is from the more radical approach. But let's just look briefly, I think it's a really powerful one. Th th there's these different, what happened? Oh, nothing. So, um, this, um, there's these different techniques, different packages of techniques, and one of them is a package of the two approaches to achieving bodhicitta. One is what they call the six causes and one effect, and then one is this more radical, outrageous one called exchanging self for others, which is what we, where that text comes out of, which I just quoted a couple of verses. So from the second one, then the basis of all of these, the second one is a combination of two, of the, of the two types, and it's got 11 little techniques, and it culminates in bodhicitta. It starts the foundation, and this is a really important one to understand. So we'll talk about, and then we'll finish. This first technique <coughs> is called equanimity. So there's a word that, you know, blah, 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 we go on about, well, you know, it's got many different definitions, but like all these words, it's so important to get the right definition, to be clear precisely. Precision and clarity that we know we need for cooking and mathematics is what Buddha demands we use to, to know these things, you know, not wishy-washy. So equanimity here is very precise meaning. And if, once you've got it, what it is, what it's referring to, is this heartfelt recognition that friend, enemy and stranger are equal to each other from one point of view. They're equal. Huh? Okay. They're equal in their wish to be happy, and they're equal in their wish not to suffer. That's it. That is equanimity. So we talk about it in lots of wishy-washy, confused ways, you know, and go on about love and compassion. That's way before love and compassion. That's like nine and ten. This is a basic one, and it's really got a powerful meaning. So what it is right this now, what we're aiming for in all these 11 techniques is bodhicitta. What bodhicitta is is this outrageous, over the top, bizarre, astonishing, extraordinary kind of state of being that, that like I said, is where you finally exchange self for others. When it's got two parts, bodhicitta. One is there's only now the thought of others, literally, and only to benefit them every second, as long as time exists. And the long-term one is I must never give up working on becoming a Buddha because then I'll be thoroughly qualified to help these sentient beings perfectly. And you go life after life after life doing this until you perfect the bodhicitta and the emptiness and you become a Buddha. So that's the culmination of these 11 techniques. So the starting point has to make, we have to make some fundamental changes in our very assumptions so right now, the assumptions we all work according to are attachment, aversion, and ignorance. And that, that, they're the categories, we, as we discussed this, when we did the meditation this morning. The object, in terms of sentient beings, all the sentient beings fit into these three categories. We have the, the objects of attachment are our friends, and they're the people who do what our attachment want. They're the objects of our aversion, who don't do what our attachment wants. In fact, they're the ones that trigger our anger. And then the third category, who are the strangers, who do neither. They neither harm nor help. So they're, of course, the vast majority of all sentient beings. So right now, this is the basis for all sentient beings, all the dogs and the ants, the kangaroos and the humans, living according to this model. So in other words, right now, as Lama Zopa says, you know, we're, we're aiming to have love and compassion, this is the point, for all sentient beings, which then culminates in great love, great compassion, which culminates in bodhicitta. So the, uh, the way we've got to start in order to get this great love and great compassion, the way we work at the moment, it will never come in a trillion years, because the logic for us now, for wanting to love somebody, which is may you be happy, the only group we have that for is the friends. 
In other words, the only person we want to be happy and the only person we don't want to suffer is the person we're attached to. So attachment is our basis for loving and having compassion. And all Buddha says is, as Lama Zopa puts it, it's unstable. Because anyway, it's only for a tiny minority. And also, it doesn't last because the friend can become the stranger, can become the enemy. It's completely unstable. So we've got to change the basis for our wanting to have love and compassion for all sentient beings. And that's what we get with equanimity. And what that means is this. Once we use logic, all these meditations you're using logic to argue with ego's ridiculous misconceptions. This is what you're doing all across the board. So here, you imagine, even as we're talking, you imagine right in front of you one of your enemies. You might use that word, but it's the object of your aversion, even the person who irritates you at work. Not to mention the person you really, really hate, or you can't forgive because they've harmed you so brutally. But to the left is your beloved, whom you run to like a magnet, whom you're so attached to. And often, unfortunately, there's often going to be the same person, isn't it? So choose two different people. And then to the right in front of you, you have a stranger, and a, a face that you can know enough to put them there, you know? But, but, you ha but for whom you are completely indifferent. And that is because they've neither harmed nor helped you. And we can see, and even if we listen to, listen to it like this, we can see how embarrassing, how embarrassingly self-centered this is. I mean, it's astonishing arrogance, you know, to think there's a few people we care about only because they do what I want. But we never question it. We think it's normal. It's just beyond shocking, you know. <laughs> so what we're trying to do is change this and try to get, to get ourselves out of the equation and look at these three people, try to see them separately from oneself. What we're trying to get, recognition, genuine recognition, and this can also all be, it can begin with intellectual, nothing wrong, that these three people, from their point of view, are identical to each other in their wish to be happy and not suffer. We have to prove it to ourselves, because right now we don't want to know about that. There's so many arguments you can use, you know, to bring, to, to break down ego's misconception. So we can, even to look at how we buy into these labels, we can see the mistake, you know. I mean, I always like to use this example lately, see if it works for your mind. You know, let's, say, let's, say, let's say George is the bloke down at number five. So he's a stranger to me, right? But I know him just enough to know his name. You know, let's say Churdan's his friend, and she tells me he gets these terrible headaches. You'll be that poor George down at number five. He gets these terrible migraines. And he's a stranger to me, okay? I'll go, oh, really, does he? The poor bloke? Pass the tea. That's the end of it, isn't it? Do you understand? You kind of, it's a bit of a drag to think about a stranger. It's kind of boring. You try to be polite, you know, and then you change the subject. <laughs> isn't it? Isn't that true? Now, let's say suddenly I meet George, and he moves me into number five. We fall in love. Let's say. Suddenly he's moved out of the stranger category to the friend category, hasn't he? Now look at me. Look at the difference now. I spend day and night loving George, looking after George, having compassion for George, spending my money to help George find doctors. I, people go, oh, Rabina, her compassion, she's so amazing, she, how she loves George. But excuse me, only because he's now my friend. So I'm, I'm getting to the point in a minute. I mean, let's say now he chucks me out and he moves children in and I'm, I'm out of number five, you know? So now he becomes the enemy, doesn't he? And then I hear about his headaches and I think, oh, may he suffer, you know? <laughs> is this not how we are? Now, my point is this. When George was a stranger, my stranger, my stranger, okay? My definition of George, my picture of George, boring person. Right? And then someone goes around, you know, interviewing people, and they ask George how he feels about his headache. He will tell you how dreadful his headache is. He'll have, he'll have, he'll have house pain, and it's unbearable. Won't he? Now, let's say when I've moved in, and the same person comes and interviews him, it'll be exactly the same story. No difference. And then when, when, and then when children moves in, and he's now my enemy, he'll have exactly the same story. All I'm getting at is this complicated story is how idiotic we are defining George, which is, you know, the, all the people in our lives, enemies, friends and strangers, according to whether or not they harm or help me, which is so embarrassingly self-centered. But the point, the point to recognize is that the enemy, the friend and the stranger, in this case I use one example, 
whether they're my friend or my stranger or my enemy is completely irrelevant to the suffering they have when they have their headache. They don't want to be suffering all the time and they only want to be happy all the time. And it's identical. Every stranger, every friend, any enemy is just a label we project and buy into about all the people on this earth. So as our mothers say, put yourself in their shoes. But the point is it's so hard to do this because when George is so divine and handsome and I'm thinking about him day and night, it's so easy to have love and compassion. But don't fool yourself, it's only because of attachment. I mean, if you had such love and compassion, how come you didn't help him when he was a stranger? So don't think you're so fancy. <laughs> as long as Oprah said, when he heard about the, um, what do you call, that big wave, you know, the tsunami. There's a big story in Sweden about this mother who ran back into the tsunami for her baby. And Lama Zaba said, yeah, amazing. But even more amazing if, he'd gone back, if she'd gone back into the tsunami for a stranger. So what we're trying to get here is a simple point to see the profound self-centered way we see the universe. We see them in terms of whether or not they help me. That's it. That's the basis, which is quite outrageous. But of course it's normal, no one questions it. So here you're trying to get out of the equation and see these three people as identical to each other. Now, not identical in terms of their kindness to you, clearly not true. Not identical in terms of their handsomeness, no. Not identical in terms of one, one's a psycho and one's a saint. They're not the same. That, none of that's the issue. They're the same only from the point of view of their wish, their primordial wish to be happy and their primordial wish to suffer. That is the basis that we will now grow upon in order to finally get to wanting all of them to be happy and all of them not to suffer, not because they make me happy, but because they want to be happy. That's the simple logic and that's the function of, it, of, of equanimity. You know? It's a huge one. Because the first thing you do if you start looking at the, the enemy who's been truly mean to you and you say he wants to be happy, we go, the first thing we go is, what do you mean? He doesn't deserve to be happy. But that deserve has got nothing to do with it. That's where it's really clear. So right now, Buddha's sort of saying to me, Rabina, just because George is kind to you is no reason to love him. Well, that's shocking to us. Equally, Rabina, just because George is mean to you is no reason not to love him. And just because the person does neither is no reason not to love him. That's what Buddha's saying, and that's where we're heading. So it's done in this nice, incremental, organized structure based upon this foundation where we fundamentally change our basis for wanting to grow these amazing states of mind. And without that, it doesn't have stability. You can't do it. It's just a, a, a brief emotional gooey feeling every now and then. This is where it's so sound, so deep when you've got this equanimity. And then you can grow from there, step by step, you know. This already is fantastic though. Equanimity is amazing. Now this doesn't mean you got to, oh well I might as well go live with the, you know, live with the enemy. No, you've got karmic connection with George. Stick to George. You keep away from the stranger, you might never meet the stranger again. And keep away from that enemy, he might be a wacko. Keep out of his way. It doesn't, equanimity is not sort of sentimental. But in your mind you know that your beloved and the enemy and the stranger are the same in their wish to be happy and not suffer. But you have certain karmic connections, that's fine. Be reasonable, be practical, you know. It's not sentimental. Do you understand? I always tell this story, still, it's not old yet. Well, it sort of is. I read my iPad, right? And I read my New York Times, as I told you. I'll show you. You all know. Doesn't matter. There's my New York Times. Oh, wrong story. So there's the front page, the home page, wherever it is. Top stories. There we go. And so down here, oh, it's not, it should be an ad there. Oh, here it comes. So down here, I saw out of the corner of my eye, down in this story here, I saw, I saw the heading say, 350 people die in ferry accident in Tasmania. Now, of course, even though I'm an American, I'm also Australian. So I go, oh, because it's my people, right? Oh, no. And then I read it and I realise it says Tanzania. And I go, oh, it's okay. <laughs> I caught myself and read it and tried to have compassion. But I'm sort of thinking, where's Tanzania, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's very deep. We can't help it, can we, you know? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> this is so much more we can talk about. I'm so sorry not to finish everything, but maybe it's time to wind up. What do you think? Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
Okay, um, what to think, what to say. That'll do. Just keep moving, everybody. Move in your path. You're the, I keep just saying this. You are the boss. You have to make the choices. You have to do the proving. You have to do the analysis. You have to do the believing. You have to do the hard work. Use Buddha. Use your guru. Use your Dharma friends and sisters and brothers. But you're the boss. You're the one running the show. You're the one who makes the choices. So choose the right teachers. Choose the right people. You know, with the teachers, give your heart to a person who's worthy of your heart, okay? Do, you know, we, we choose so much junky friends who are so needy, we're ridiculous. So don't just choose some junky person who says they're a guru. Don't believe a word of it. You choose a person who's worthy of your heart, okay? You choose a person who is worthy of your heart because you're going to have them till the day you get enlightened. Long-term relationship. So check up. As the Bonker Rinpoche says, you better choose your guru very carefully because you're going to end up like them. I think that's great. <laughs> okay? So never give up. Keep working. Keep working on your own potential. Develop love and respect for yourself. Develop incredible self-respect. Incredible kindness to yourself. And that when you can be kind to yourself, you can also be brutal and point out your silly mistakes and not be nervous, you know? And know your potential like this and then of course you're qualified to be able to help others then but you've got to start with yourself there's no question about that and find your own way find your own style find your own path find your own teachers be clear one step at a time and have the, the biggest one the best prayer to have the best aspiration as his holiness the Dalai Lama says always aspire to do what is most beneficial and if you can long term better than short term so what that means is this aspiration. Sounds kind of simple, you know. I remember one time I asked Lama Zopa what to do, and it, like as usual, he either ignores me or you know whatever. What, what are you asking me for? But this time he said, I don't care what you do as long as you do what's most beneficial. So then of course we go, well, how do I know what's most beneficial? And the fact is we don't. So what do you do? Well, for me this is the analogy. It's like you're walking on, you know, it's like you're walking on a road, and your it's your life, so it's your road, babe. It's your potholes, it's your ba barriers, it's your ugly things, it's your life. So you, what do you do? You're not sh it's like for me, the analogy is it's not, you're not sure where the turn off is. You're not sure whether you should leave that job, leave that relationship, have that relationship, have that job, go here, become a nun. All these options look like possible to us, but we just don't know what the right choice is. Well, put it like this. You don't know what the turn off is, so you can't just speculate. So what do you do? You can't stand still, you can't go back, you can't take any old cute turn off because it looks nice. That's just following attachment and that just, you lose the plot if you do that. All you can do is get out of bed every morning, do whatever you do today and with the aspiration. Lama Zopa says everything exists on the tip of the wish and that means the thought and that runs the universe. So start with the thought. Not sure what I want, I'm not sure what's the right thing to do, but may I do what's most beneficial. That's a powerful, clear intention. May I do what's most beneficial. It's not crossing your fingers and hoping for the best. What it's doing, that aspiration, because every thought, everything exists on the tip of the wish, what it's doing, it seems to me, is nourishing the karmic seeds you've already planted, which will be, which will ripen as what is most beneficial. So you don't know where the turn off is, so you get out of bed, you do your practice every day, you keep your vows. I'm gonna send those documents to all you people, I haven't forgot, it's all there in my computer, I promise, I promise, I promise. And then you keep your vows, you keep your commitment, you do a bit of practice every day, even if you're bored, I don't care, just do it, sow the seeds, you know? Keep your commitment, keep your word of honor. Do something every day, do that job. Be in that relationship. You're not sure if it's the right thing, but don't have a panic attack about it. Just may I do what's most beneficial. May I recognize the turn off when it comes. If you have this sincere wish every day and you just put one foot in front of the other and you go to bed at night, you get up in the morning, you do it again, and then guess what? One day you'll go, oh, I see, there it is. Because you couldn't see the turn off until it comes. So you don't chew it like a dog with a bone. Don't get anxious about it. Don't panic. Don't take the wrong turn off. Just keep moving one foot in front of the other without panicking and aspire all the time. May I do what is most beneficial and you will, I promise. So be brave, be courageous. Even if it's a tough choice, you will do it. Then it'll be straight and narrow to enlightenment. You won't get lost, I promise. So we dedicate. 
I just think we keep it simple, just have a few thoughts, you know, just think all this time we've been together, these, all this two weeks I've been in the centre, you know, every night doing different things, all of us together, some of us together this weekend, whatever. As many thoughts as all of us have had, which is as many seeds each of us has planted, may we nourish them every day with these aspirations, with our practice, never giving up on ourselves, never giving up on sentient beings, so that we can eventually become a Buddha, no matter how long it takes, for the sake of suffering sentient beings. And may all our lamas, all our precious gurus, Lama Zopa, whose center this is, and our other teachers, all our own teachers, and His Holiness, all the precious holy beings whom we need badly on this earth, may they live long, long, long lives. And may we live long lives practicing virtue. The world needs us. Lama Sange Drogyune Drowa Chikyang Malupa Dei Sala Kupa Shok Jang Chob Sem Chog Rinpoche Maki Panam Ke Gyochig Kie pa nyam pa me pa yang Gong ne gong du pa pa And may we never develop even for a moment wrong views towards the deeds of our most precious gurus. With faith and respect gained from seeing their goodness, may their full inspiration flow into our mind. And if you haven't got a teacher yet, and if you've got connection with this path, just think that they're out there twiddling their thumbs waiting for you to recognize them. So aspire every day. In the seven limbs, the two lines are most precious. May you're begging the holy beings to never leave us in samsara and you're begging the holy beings to teach. They are the cause of meeting the teachings and meeting the teachers. So have this aspiration every day. Don't be nervous, don't be scared, don't sit back and be passive, be proactive. May I meet my teacher, may I recognize my lamas, may I find my path, may I find my lineage. If you have come with this path, it'll come, I promise. Okay. Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you. What they're going to do now, what they're going to do is offer what's called a mandala. It looks like nine pins bowling, you know, but it's actually meant to represent the universe. So they're going to offer a representation of the universe. And then you can imagine piling up all the marvelous things of the universe onto it and offering. They call it a thanksgiving, thanking, as if the Buddha were here himself, thanking for the teachings. And then they're going to offer representations of the body. Traditionally, they're wrapped up in cutters, but never mind, you do it next time. Yeah. Body, speech, and mind. Where's the mind one? The text. Where's the speech? Oh, there we go. Okay. And you know the right way around. Yes. Good on you. Good. And they're going to offer those as representations of the body, speech, and mind of all the holy beings as a cause for us to all achieve those. So it's got great meaning, okay?